Good afternoon and welcome everyone to the third event of the conversation series, Why Architecture Belongs in the Museum, featuring today Columbia University Art History and Archaeology Professor Barry Bergdahl. Welcome Barry. My name is Marcela Ramos. I am the program manager for the Art, Film and Culture program at the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies at Harvard University called Dr. Class. This conversation is part of a bigger project, a multi-year initiative uh, titled Curating Architecture Across the Americas. It's organized by Dr. Class in collaboration with the Harvard Department of History of Art and Architecture at Harvard and led by Professor Patricio El Real. Curating architecture's main goal is to bring together institutions, curators, and scholars to discuss the role of architecture and collection, architecture exhibitions uh, in curatorial practices and cultural debates to establish a dynamic interdisciplinary and transnational network and to facilitate scholarly research in academic and museum settings. We had a first event in 2019 that gathered architecture curators, historians, and architects working in art museums and exhibition architecture galleries from Mexico and the US. In the symposium Espacios de Contacto Contact Spaces, Mexico, US, you can find all that information online on our website, and we will have a third iteration of Curating Architecture titled Historias Ausentes, Missing Histories, that would take place in 2022, next year at Harvard, uh, to foment historical research on architecture exhibitions um, across the Americas. Uh, as I mentioned, the talk today is the third of five events for the Why Architecture Belongs in the Museum. So stay tuned for the upcoming two. On April 21st, we will have Valentina Moimas from the Centre Pompidou in Paris. And May 5th, Patricio El Real from Harvard University. Patricio, who will also be our moderator today, is Assistant Professor of History of Art and Architecture here at Harvard and works on modern architecture and its transnational connections with a focus on the Americas. He holds a PhD in Architecture, History and Theory from Columbia University and a Master of Architecture from Harvard's Graduate School of Design. You can find uh, the rest of his biography on the chat. Um, so before giving the floor to Patricio, just two mentions. One is that Why Architecture Belongs in the Museum, the series is run in parallel with a course uh, called Architecture in the Museum. It's run by Harvard University, Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, and Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile. Professor El Real will tell us more about the course itself, but I just want to thank again um, our faculty from these universities, Carolina Sepulvia, Cristina Lopez, and Salvador Lizarraga uh, for their collaboration uh, and interest in, in participating in this with us. Uh, it's, it's an honor to be working with these two universities and with this faculty. So thank you. Uh, and housekeeping, just to finish, the event will be one hour long. We will be, and we are recording the event. Uh, you're gonna have all this information soon on YouTube. The first two talks are already there, so you can get that information on our channels and you can find on the chat also the information about all the social media and links to our events um, so you can get more information. At the end, during the talk, please submit all the questions uh, on the chat. At the bottom, you will see a Q&A button where you can send your questions. Uh, the only particularity is that we will try to, if you want, 
uh, that it's it works. Um, you will be a panelist when you ask the question, so you can turn on your camera and please introduce yourself before the question and then turn off the camera. So thank you so much, Patricio. You have the floor. Stella. Um, uh, and for the seminars, you can find more information in, um, in the website of Dr. Class. Um, it's been a fantastic sort of experience um, that we wish to continue, and I'm going to get into the details um, of it. Um, today, um, it is a tremendous honor to have Barry Bergdahl here today with us. Professor Bergdahl is the Mayor Shapiro Professor of Art History at Columbia University and the former chief curator in the Department of Architecture and Design at the Museum of Modern Art. He is the preeminent scholar on architecture exhibitions. Early on, as a historian, he called upon scholars to examine the art of architecture curatorship, opening a new field of historical inquiry. His ideas have shaped and continue to shape this field and has been fundamental to this program that we have organized. He's working on a book on the history of architecture exhibitions based on his Mellon lectures in the fine arts at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. He's also a curator who has organized and staged numerous exhibitions at MoMA, the Center, the Canadian Center for Architecture, Musée d'Orsay in Paris, and many others. Thanks to Barry, MoMA's collection exploded with works and original architectural materials from Latin America, forever changing the curatorial potential of MoMA exhibitions. I had the privilege of closely working with him on several shows, most notably in 2015 for Latin America in Construction, Architecture, 1985. As chief curator of architecture and design, he changed the landscape and culture of the department, bringing architecture's material evidence to the forefront of the museum experience. This was not an easy task. Architectural drawings, he was told, are not user-friendly. They are too difficult for the general museum goer, many thought. Henri Labrouste, Structure Brought to Light, which opened in 2013, changed skeptics and detractors' minds. Architects and non-architects alike were mesmerized by the 19th century architectural drawings and models. And I know this by watching the public being entranced by their works presented and telling them to please don't get so close to them. <laughs> and please don't touch, even though they, are, they were completely, completely just fabulous materials. Who knew an exhibition of historical architecture could become a blockbuster at MoMA. Um, well, Barry near. Barry has his finger on the pulse of culture. He has insisted on the need to ground contemporary practices in the history of architecture as a 2008 home delivery, Fabricating the Modern Dwelling, testifies. He has used architecture exhibitions not to measure the temperature of contemporary architecture, but to focus and guide it as rising currents Projects for New York's waterfront in 2010 make clear two years before Hurricane Sandy hit the northeastern seaboard of the United States. I could go on and on. His complete bio uh, um, uh, CV is there. But if I may say one last thing, it is that thanks to Bar it is thanks to Barry that architecture does indeed belong in the museum, and that it does so on its own merits and values. Please join me in welcoming Professor Barry Bergdahl. Hey, thank, thank you so much, Patricio. I'm glad you don't want to stop working together. We'll keep, uh, we'll keep working at this difficult uh, subject. I like the fact that the series is, um, implies a kind of question, why? I suppose uh, I want to turn it into a sentence of why does architecture belong in the museum? Uh, so I want to look at historically with you at what I'm calling, let me bring up a shared screen immediately, since even in a Zoom format, uh, art historians can't speak without images. Uh, here we go. Um, this is the 
denouement of the lecture will be the near flooding of New York that Patricio just made reference to. Uh, and so you can rest assured that when this image that's on the screen at the moment reappears that the end is near, hopefully not the end of New York, but the end of this uh, today's episode of the discussion of the ongoing question of why and how does architecture belong in the museum, how to bring something as complicated as what's on screen uh, into the spaces of the gallery and how to make sure that it doesn't die there, but in fact achieves a, a new life as a catalyst and a promoter of architectural debate about the world outside. In fact, I think architecture of all media is the media in the museum that is continually negotiating uh, on either side of the wall, trying to create a crucible for discussion inside the institution of the museum in a way that the museum will continually spill outside of its walls. Perhaps not an André Malraux museum without walls, but a museum in which the passage back and forth across the wall uh, aims to, in fact, change um, the everyday situation and the everyday debate. And as I hope you'll see with my discussion of the exhibition on the screen at the end, Rising Currents, that the museum has the capacity, if not to change the world, at least to change the discourse about the world. And that is at least a first step. The images that are about to appear are probably ones that might be well known to you because every uh, discussion of architecture and its history in the museum. And in fact, the history of architecture in the museum and the history of the museum are approximately of the same age. But the museum had a relatively easy birth in the decades around the time of the French Revolution, depicted here on the left in this famous painting by the French painter Hubert Robert of an imagined transformation of the Palace of the Louvre into an art museum projected here in the 1790s, whereas architecture was going to have a great deal of difficulty entering into those walls of the museum. Hubert Robert imagined, of course, that architecture, the architecture of antiquity, the model uh, for contemporary architecture in his view and that of many others, would enter via another medium, via the medium of painting. That was, of course, a way to bring the representation of architecture inside the museum, since quite obviously, buildings themselves are difficult to exhibit inside uh, other buildings, as well as, as Patricio evoked, the long-term standing issue that architecture, in order to justify a place in the museum, often wanted to assimilate itself with the other fine arts. We can discuss that in the question and answer period. I brought together some Im images from uh, the travels uh, around Latin America in preparation for the exhibition that Patricio uh, worked on together with me. Uh, not that I'm going to speak about that, but I found these things along the way. Always trying to answer the question, how can you exhibit architecture? Now, of course, one way to call attention to architecture in the real world would simply be to take the apparatus of the museum outdoors, such as here, one of the largest museum display cases ever constructed around the uh, house of the famous 19th century Argentinian President Sarmiento in the Tigre district of Buenos Aires. So we can take the museum outside, uh, or we could simply take the apparatus of the labels of text, of ways of calling attention to things, such as the whole series of texts that accompanies one on the visit here to one of the final works, indeed posthumous, of the great Colombian architect Rogelio Salmona. This is the Centro Cultural de Moravia, which is a district in a rather poor district in uh, Medellin that was completed in the um, 1980s. And as you can see, as you move through uh, here, there's little confidence that people can encounter architecture without some exp uh, explanation. So we find the whole apparatus of a museum display of an exhibition on the building itself. So rather than bring the building into the museum, we'll bring the building, the museum outside here, mirrors of water uh, here, explaining to us that ramps are made in order to enjoy or savor uh, time. You can see people didn't quite get it. They're stopping to take photographs. They're meant to keep moving and having a time-based experience. Um, as Patricio evoked, I am currently working on and have been for some time a uh, historical account thematic of the difficult history of trying to bring architecture into the museum, either in the case of individual instances of exhibitions or even with the creation of departments of architecture, the Museum of Modern Arts being the oldest and longest lived, having been founded in 1932. 
this is a photograph which accompanied the Mellon lectures and perhaps it will end up being the cover of the book, I don't know, the title of which is already displayed here, Out of Sight, it's important to see it, <laughs> Out of Sight in Plain View, A History of Exhibiting Architecture Since 1750. The image here is from 1955 and it shows the Japanese house in the garden at the Museum of Modern Art or more accurately adjacent to the outdoor sculpture garden on 54th Street. So here, in fact, the architecture almost got into the museum. It got to the very edge of the precinct of the Museum of Modern Art with a full-scale one-to-one uh, building, a replica of a 17th century uh, Japanese temple here displayed as a, uh, a model of um, a house. It turned out to be paradoxically one of the most uh, loved and visited of all Museum of Modern Art exhibitions on architecture in the entire 20th century, although one could argue whether in fact it was an exhibition in the sense that we think of it as a gallery-based um, means of display, or for that matter, if it was displaying modern architecture, but that's not really my subject today. Here's a photograph I took on the morning of my first day at work at the Museum of Modern Art in 2007, uh, and as you can see, the museum was already beginning to uh, crowd up. This is nothing compared to what was an average day during the more than a decade that I spent working at the Department of Architecture and Design, uh, although might shock us now in a world of social distancing. This is really a mild moment in MoMA attendance in recent years when the museum has become a very, very crowded precinct. Very curious given the fact that around the same time, the internet began to explode with websites that make it possible for us, even if you're bored during this lecture on your computer, you could go probing around, let's say, on the upper left on the website of Architizer and see a display, a kind of exhibition in, um, in, in web space of recent projects, uh, curated, since today curator, curating means anytime that you make a selection from the grocery store department, uh, um, pasta department uh, to a um, internet organization of um, photographs is referred to as curating. So the question remains open and I had it for myself in 2007 and in a sense I haven't really resolved it. Uh, why uh, even attempt to exhibit architecture in the museum in the 21st century uh, when it would seem that that, that that practice had perhaps been superseded by other uh, media. Uh, that said, people still flock to the Museum of Modern Art, so I decided, being a pragmatist, to take advantage of their presence and try to craft a place for architecture in the museum, rather than worrying about whether or not it should be there in the first place. Now, let's go back for a little bit of history. I assure you I'm not going to retrace now the uh, next year, 90-year history of the Department of Architecture, later Architecture and Design um, at MoMA, but I am struck by the very first sentence of the very first publication here at the upper left of your screen. This is the book that accompanied the exhibition falsely remembered as the international style, the title of which was rather Modern Architecture International Exhibition. And it's often seen as a moment of beginning, a new adventure. Yet the very first sentence tells us expositions and exhibitions have perhaps changed the character of American architecture of the last 40 years more than any other factor. So this was inspiring for me as a historian to realize, first of all, that the Museum of Modern Arts Department belonged in a longer history, and moreover, that its earliest curators of architecture were confident that exhibitions had the capacity literally to change the face of American architecture, perhaps even the face of America. They were referring back, of course, to the World's Fair, the Exposition of 1893 in the little a thumbnail up in the upper right. Uh, take a later MoMA curator of architecture, Peter Blake, who worked briefly at the museum in the late 1940s and early 1950s, here penning an article under the title, Architecture is an Art and MoMA is its Prophet, a mixed metaphor if ever there is was one. We can return to that. I'm interested in one aspect, which I announced in my title slide and I want to make a case for today which is not simply bringing architecture into the gallery, but using its presence in the gallery to have an activist relationship to both the practice of architecture and to the public engagement with architecture with the hopes that they will take the thoughts, the discussions, 
that they have in the exhibition to the outside world and continue them outside the world of the, the space of the gallery. Indeed, what I'm interested in is the notion that the architecture exhibition lives in the museum, but is of a fundamentally different nature than other exhibitions in a museum or other displays. Not only are its objects different, often representations rather than the actual physical object, but frequently it seems to me the most effective exhibitions do not try to sacralize, despite the profit metaphor here, uh, architecture, but rather engage us in what German romantic critics call a Kunstkonversation or a conversation about art. In other words, the arch architecture in the museum is not about crafting a place for the quiet contemplation of masterpieces and for individual experience, but rather for activating discussion, debate, and for activating the culture of architecture. I'm not interested in the notion that exhibitions reflect the world of architecture. I'm interested in the fact that they participate in the world of architecture. Let's go back though, just for a moment to that uh, uh, earliest exhibition, the exhibition, which in fact was a test balloon to see if such a department could exist. Uh, it was staged, and my cursor works here, I hope, in these floors of this skyscraper recently finished uh, under the then zoning laws with these setbacks, modeled at least in its stylistic characteristics, if not in its overall morphology, on the French Renaissance Chateau of the Loire. So it was scarcely a place where one might seek to launch a revolution in American taste, or at least an attempted one, to change the taste of the American public, of American practicing architects, and of most particularly, because we are talking about the Museum of Modern Art, of clients, of wealthy clients for architecture, be they individual or um, institutional or commercial, to in fact achieve a, a kind of birthright for what came to be known as the international style. Now, my subject of my lecture today is not really the international style. I just want to remind you of this taste shaping mission, this kind of activism of style that very famously was the mission of the Museum of Modern Art from its founding. Um, and you might notice here in the Corbusier room that in fact, architecture enters the museum, not with drawings as Patricio was mentioning, uh, not even with design models that were used by the architect in conceiving the work, but rather in a model that was commissioned by others to be displayed in this exhibition. So newly fabricated representation and photographs, all of which have been hung on the wall to the same size and with the same hanging line in one of the nine galleries of the um, exhibition. The exhibition was accompanied by this scholarly publication by the uh, curators, Henry Russell Hitchcock, and Philip Johnson, uh, and then popularized in a commercial book that had rather different content uh, and coined the title on its uh, dust jacket there of the international style. It's interesting to follow the fate of some of the materials here. The model of the Bauhaus presented in the room that showed the work primarily of Walter Gropius um, here on screen. You see it with its sweet little skirt there as said so. Uh, need to be domesticated when it was brought into the gallery. And I think you can see actually what a uh, conservative lackluster affair in terms of installation art, this first exhibition of 1932 was, particularly if we compare the mise-en-scene of the exact same model by Herbert Beyer for the uh, two years earlier for the German Werkbund exhibition at the, um, uh, in Paris uh, at the Grand Palais. Um, so, but one thing that becomes clear, I think, with Herbert Beyer, and it's been an inspiration for me and for many others, is that unlike Philip Johnson, who thought, try to hang this like painting and sculpture, hide the apparatus of lighting necessary for this model, Herbert Beyer understood that to make an architectural exhibition was itself a project in architecture, and that the gallery must become a type of architectural space. Uh, so the contrast between these with similar types of materials, I think, is extremely telling. And no surprise that Herbert Beyer was one of the first to have a theory of architectural installation, which still has a great deal of validity in the notion of creating experience in order to activate the vision and even the movements of visitors. Often forgotten in that first show is the last room, which you see here in the larger of the two images. It is very famous in the history of housing. In another context, we could discuss why the history of modern architecture and the history of modern housing seem to have often a uh, relationship 
um, that only intersects at times rather than being integrated. And indeed in this exhibition of 1932, the room on housing was, was entrusted uh, to a sign of subcontracted to Lewis Mumford, who was going to be aided in his housing enterprises by a young figure we'll meet in a moment, who is my heroine, Catherine Bauer. This room for me is the birth of what I want to talk to you about in my short time this afternoon, and that is the museum as activist. Because although the photographs here on the wall are of the exact same size and the exact same disposition as in, let's say, the Corbusier room in the upper left, the aim is exactly the opposite. The photographs in the Corbusier room are meant to inspire inspiration. The photographs in the housing room to the right want to produce exactly the opposite effect. They want to disgust you, horrify you, shock you. Uh, it does raise a question whether one can bring things inside the walls of an art museum that are meant for something other than aesthetic uh, admiration. But such was the aim of this housing um, exhibition there. Uh, and here she is. You can see how young the people were who were working at the Museum uh, of uh, Modern Art at the time in her 20s, Catherine Bauer. She was by 1934 to publish this uh, work that's still regarded. In fact, it's just come out in a reprint edition, Modern Housing, still regarded as one of the definitive works on reflecting on uh, housing, particularly in the urban situation in uh, modernity. Uh, she would also play a key role in this uh, example of a really activist exhibition, the housing exhibit of the city of New York. Now in a slightly different setting, the townhouse that the museum uh, occupied on 53rd Street, its second temporary home. But as you can see, despite the kind of neo-Rococo uh, ceiling decorations here, the space has been entirely transformed by super graphics, by a kind of walk-in uh, approach to images of the city, uh, by a play on contrast between a recently uh, completed housing development in Philadelphia uh, and New York City tenements from the Lower East Side. And in fact, as we continue, here's the, you enter into this building, this is the museum at that for a couple of years, um, and 11 West 53rd Street, still MoMA's address. And then we bifurcate, we can either go to the left into this room, which was removed from a tenement in the East 80s, East 80s at that point, one of the poorest districts in the city of New York, moved together with its furniture and to the horror of the Department of Health with its cockroaches for uh, the well-heeled visitors to the Museum of Modern Art to see how the other half lives, to borrow a phrase from the muckraking journalist Jacob Reese of a generation earlier, or see the exact same spatial dimension of a room in the um, international style uh, with uh, chrome furniture, uh, clean, uh, well-lit, uh, was this an exercise in taste, in sanitation? Uh, in any case, it was an appeal for a transformation of the consciousness about the housing situation of a teeming city. And indeed, the museum organized not only guided visits for regular visitors, but they invited city officials to see this model of a projected uh, housing for Christie Forsyth Street on the Lower East Side itself and to try to advocate for its realization, this housing project, which in fact went over the existing block uh, structure. So this too, we could discuss in great detail, but the key thing is this a notion of the museum as a linchpin between public and public elected officials and indeed appointed officials of the administration. And many of the things that we think of today as innovations in display techniques come of age uh, early on with this history of activism, in which the Museum of Modern Art was continually experimenting um, and innovating. And I would say that I think one of the fascinating things about the history of architectural exhibitions is that everyone demands a reinvention. There are no formulas to go back to. The subject matter needs always to find its architecture of its exhibition architecture, its spatial um, effectiveness. And this exhibition not only had statistics and super graphics uh, and the like, not yet able to literally show film in the space, but even evoking the filmic, uh, but most extraordinarily in a kind of foreshadowing of the idea of relational aesthetics, the last gallery was a real estate office in which one could meet with a counselor to discuss mortgages and the financial situation in the heart of the depression of the 1930s as visitors wanted not only to know what was happening in housing, but how it might affect them. 
when the museum actually built its own quarters in time for its 10th birthday, recognizing that it had indeed become an institution that was here to stay, putting its name and address on the roof in case Corbusier were able to fly by, he would know exactly where to head uh, first as this new house for modern ethos or modern ideology. Uh, one of the earliest museum designs in the history of museum architecture to involve moving through a glass revolving door into a lobby at sidewalk space, representing not by a flight of stairs, a separation of the realm of art from public life, but rather the continuity of the public zone into the spaces and activities of the museum itself. And there was to be uh, uh, created a series of exhibitions which fascinate me. They would be completely subsumed by the internet today. These are exhibitions of, extreme, of extremely modest dimensions and of extremely um, short duration, sometimes a matter of only a handful of weeks that would activate the daily press in order to pay attention to them. So the museum becoming a kind of agent for press attention, for getting issues into circulation outside of its own walls. These I label, although the term was never used at MoMA, as editorial exhibitions. Some of them could consist simply of a series of five or six uh, panels. And often they were related to real architectural projects that were underway in New York or even further afield. I'm only going to show you two this afternoon. This one staged in uh, 1937 when the plans for the New York World's Fair of 1939, you see it in its realized form in the upper right, 1939-1940 in Flushing Meadow Park, were announced that it would include an ideal residential district to be called Tomorrow Town and to feature the House of Tomorrow. Uh, and the fear that those houses were going to look like the fashionable neo-colonial of the Tony suburbs of say Westchester County or nearby Long Island, rather than what the last ideal housing exhibition, 1927, the famous white city of the Weisenhof Siedlung directed by uh, Mies van der Rohe at Stuttgart had looked like. Could this be an announcement of a different notion about not only the style of building, but the very nature uh, of building for American housing? So this was an attempt to try to convince the people who were undertaking the New York World's Fair as simultaneously a popular and a commercial venture. Here you see the National Cash Register um, uh, exhibition building, which included a cash register that recorded the number of visitors uh, on the cash register atop the building. Architecture parlante or architecture payante, I'm not quite sure which. Here the uh, seal test uh, craft foods pavilion and they find the theme building of the fair. But here we have the brochure that attended the uh, guide to the town of tomorrow, your guide to the Long Island colonial Helm, number 15, second from the entrance to the town of tomorrow. The editorial exhibition had failed. The most modern building was this one, modern by its incorporation of electricity rather than perhaps its neo Mount Vernon style. The Museum of Modern Art having failed with the editorial decided to respond with something much more spectacular. In the second season of the exhibition for 1940, they invited Frank Lloyd Wright to fill the halls of the ground floor with a display of his architecture, purposely made models by the students at Taliesin. You see Frank Lloyd Wright literally continuing to draw on the drawings as he was installing them, curator's nightmare. He had previously exhibited his idea of a new form for American urbanism in a polemical display in 1935 nearby at Rockefeller Center. So he was no foreigner to using the architectural display for attempting to propose a different way of seeing outdoor reality, of seeing even the use of land from the backyard uh, to the entire shape of urban, or for that matter, transcontinental settlement. He was invited to conceive for the newly created Museum of Modern Art Sculpture Garden. Here you see it in its first iteration by the curator architect John McAndrew, photographed shortly after the building was completed and before Frank Lloyd Wright arrived in a truck with his drawings and meant to turn that sculpture garden into a construction site for here was to be erected right in the middle of this kind of sub Borle Marx uh, patterning there, uh, a model house, which would have been one of the earliest of his Usonian houses. So here the museum wanted to pick up on a tradition that had been born with the idea of the world's fairs in 1851 in London, 
the display of a model house for improved dwelling for, as the British would say, for the laboring classes to be displayed in a fashionable neighborhood where people who might actually affect change could think about how the other half lives. The buildings department of the city of New York was not having it. They refused to uh, give a building permit for Frank Lloyd Wright's Usonian house. You see the project for the house in the upper half of the screen here that would have therefore um, given a suburban house in the sculpture garden, the Museum of Modern Art, rather surreal encounter uh, in the summer of 1940. Rather the following year, as the US was getting prepared to enter the war, Buckminster Fuller created the first house in the garden, the Dymaxion Deployment un un Unit, the first time that the museum took on the idea of emerging, uh, emergency housing and even suggesting that current technologies could solve the problem. So a range of architectural propositions here, but the idea that a completely new idea in architecture and a completely new taste might have a test run at one-to-one -one scale. The editorializing, there's the, uh, the it, don't have many views of the interior, which was furnished by Bloomingdale's department store. So from the beginning, a kind of advertising tie-in. Um, the editorializing continued. Here we have an exhibition of 1946, uh, hoping to get a modern building finally for New York City in the uh, choice of Manhattan as the terrain for the United Nations, the new organization born of the Second World War and of the failure of the League of Nations. And that indeed is evoked and you're seeing almost the whole exhibition here, a home for the United Nations, must we repeat the Geneva fiasco? And that was of course the fact that for the League of Nations in 1927, both Hannes Meyer on the left and Corbusier on the right had been passed over in favor of a latter-day uh, Beaux-Arts complex, which still houses part of the United Nations on Lake Geneva. This continued after the war, yours can be a planned community, you can help, so over and over again, these exhibitions this one of a much larger scale that sought to engage the public in thinking about how they wanted the world outside to be shaped, how they as visitors to a museum could enter into a professional discourse, how the museum could serve to break open the discussion among architects and planners and the professionally trained, the people who would be churned out of, let's say, Walter Gropius or Jose Luis Sertz, uh, graduate School of Design or Catolica in Santiago in order to engage directly with here the emerging idea of participatory community planning. The House in the Garden series came to a, um, a kind of real denouement in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War uh, when through federal subsidies the American suburb was uh, kind of turbocharged uh, through the 1950s and 1960s. And the Museum of Modern Art decided to respond uh, to the emerging models of neo-colonial uh, Levittown uh, and others by, oops, excuse me, by proposing this modern model building made of wood of cypress cladding by the architect Marcel Breuer, 1949, who installed this famous house in the garden to demonstrate that the servantless two uh, mother and father, two children, um, canonic household uh, could take modern form. This is probably also the only time that a suburban garden was displayed in the sculpture garden. So the idea too of the display of landscape and of garden art even harder than bringing architecture into the city and into the museum. This was uh, followed the following year built on the success of the house in the garden of Marcel Breuer by Los Angeles architect Gregory Ains exhibition house, but now done in conjunction with Women's Home Companion. So uh, what we call in the United States, the shelter press, sort of taste-making uh, magazines thought to be uh, read largely by uh, women about lifestyle, about housing and the like, as the museum explored not only new financial partnerships, but also an ever-expanding way to popularize its message. Now there's one more type of um, exhibition that I've only recently begun to work on. I'm going to talk about this next week at the Society of Architectural Historians annual meeting. So just a little preview of that. If we go ahead to the role, surprisingly, that the Museum of Modern Art would play a pioneering role, not only in advocating for modernism, but in advocating for historic preservation. Historic preservation, of course, to quote the famous words of Villeduc in the 19th century, when he said, 
architectural restoration, both the thing and the word are modern. And the Museum of Modern Art declaring, if we don't protect the great monuments, the great buildings, and even the great urban fabric of the 19th and the earlier 20th century, what will be left of that which we're trying to create now for the second half of the 19th century. So we see an unusual alliance in this famous photograph, one of the only times where Philip Johnson not only carried a protest um, a sign with which we can still agree, uh, but also walking with uh, Jane Jacobs of all people, famous as the author of The Death and Life of American Cities. And here they are campaigning with others, trying to save irreparably the uh, New York's Pennsylvania Station by McKim, Mead and White. That was an unsuccessful effort in 1962, but it was not so unusual if we pay attention to the fact that after Philip Johnson's return to the Museum of Modern Art from the GSD, now trained as an architect in the late 40s, he had proposed that museum exhibitions could become agents, catalysts for raising a consciousness and a support and an awareness of the need to designate buildings as historical heritage, particularly in the young countries of the new world and obviously particularly in the United States. One of the most dramatic was this extraordinary act of deciding that Philadelphia's Independence Hall, you see it in the left in the photograph, aerial photograph of the early 1950s, surrounded by one of the most vibrant late 19th and early 20th century commercial districts in any United States city, that the city needed to be demolished in order to create here a, uh, what still exists, a frame of empty space for admiring Independence Hall as a singular work of art. A kind of musification, if you will, of the city by creating a frame around an object by destroying the city itself. Along with it, the earliest steel framed building in uh, Philadelphia, as well as works by the famous architect Frank Furness, all were going to be lost to this. Philip Johnson joined the protests against this and even proposed that if this didn't stop, he was going to create an exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in New York called Philadelphia Destroys Its Architectural Heritage. Uh, this never took place. However, a few years later, perhaps prompted by this exhibition in 1955, which took place in the private quarters of the University Club across the street from the Museum of Modern Art, Monuments of Manhattan, an exhibition that included grading of buildings by um, national significance, local significance, draping them in black if they had been demolished in the planning time that led up to putting the exhibition on the wall and printing its catalog that you see here, and then framing in red the photographs of all of the buildings that were in danger. It was also the exhibition that gave rise to the modern phenomenon of the urban walking tour led by the uh, infamous Henry Hope Reed, whose name you see here. So the idea too of a selective, a kind of guided museum tour to the city itself, culminating in this exhibition by the brand new United States National Trust for Historic Preservation in association with Architectural Forum Magazine and the Department of Architecture and Design at MoMA of architecture worth saving uh, in the autumn of 1958. Uh, including Grand Central Station, Pennsylvania Station, which was still standing, and many other monuments that were considered in, uh, in danger there. In fact, I think you can see here Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, Larkin Building, which fell to the wrecking ball shortly thereafter, uh, as well as, of course, here, Pennsylvania Station. This was, in fact, also one of the agendas, surprisingly enough, of the one of the most curious shows the museum uh, ever staged, still mystifying many uh, historians. We can discuss it in the question and answer period in a moment, if you like. The Architecture of the École des Beaux-Arts in 1975, which exhibited these famous student drawings from the 19th, late 18th and 19th century from the very academic system that the Museum of Modern Art had seemed to want to uh, bury in the past in 1932, were now brought out to promote an agenda that would critique urban renewal and critique the loss of the rich historic fabric of the city in, uh, to the ideology of tabula rasa modernism. So this led to a great discussion of whether the Museum of Modern Art was abandoning its mission or updating it for continued involvement in a uh, critique, uh, a continual engagement with an evolving uh, architectural debate. 
So now I want to take a leap forward to that photograph I showed you at the very beginning, my arrival at the Museum of Modern Art. Um, hideously, if not ridiculously um, ambitious, I decided that since at that point there was a vacant lot, a very rare thing in the um, Im immediately next to the Museum of Modern Art where a hotel had stood, the museum had acquired it perhaps for some future expansion, uh, but I had taken the job under the conditions that this would become my outdoor uh, architectural exhibition space. The director asked me what I wanted to do with it. I said I wanted to build on the popularity of the house and the garden. I wanted to show the new conditions for fabricating architecture as in relationship to uh, new forms of digital fabrication, of factory production, and of a revived interest in the prefabrication of the uh, earlier parts of the 20th century. I said I was also fascinated by the fact that the history of architecture tends always to be progressive and want to only account for successes, and that the history of prefabrication is often a history of failures. But many of those failures look different if we look back and see their untapped potential. So it seemed to me it was an exercise both for historic revisionism, but also as I hoped to affect some kind of truce between what at that period in 2007, 2008, was a bit of a war between the digital fabricators and those who were the revival revivers of 1950s modes of prefabrication by showing both and bringing them into dialogue. So I had a lot of complex um, agenda for this show, but I also wanted to use the house as something that was palpable, that directly related to the largest public interest possible in order to engage people with a topic that might seem arcane if expressed simply in relationship to fabrication. But there are a number of other issues here that I think made this into at least an experiment for me in uh, picking up with the activist tradition of the Museum of Modern Art. And if I've shown you a bit of a history of activism at the Museum of Modern Art, it was a history that I excavated not only as a historian, but as a self-defense mechanism to be able always to say that the experiment I wanted to undertake at MoMA was not something that was contrary to the museum's ethos, but that was deeply embedded in its complex historical DNA. So it was an attempt not only to engage the public uh, with what I thought was vital at any given moment in the architectural debate, but to assuage the fears of the Museum of Modern Art uh, trustees and powers that be uh, that I might be uh, undertaking uh, something a little bit uncanonical. This is a complex exhibition. I can't go into all of its details, but one thing that became clear to me uh, as the project developed, and this is one reason that exhibitions are so interesting, is that you learn as you are doing them. It is not as though you have a preconceived notion and you simply execute it. I thought if I want to bring together objects which are not related to one another by stylistic terms, I'm not proposing that this is the new international style and that I can define the four or five aesthetic categories that make all of these buildings, all of these objects, all of these experiments appear um, to be belong with one another. Rather, it is the fact that every one of these diverse objects, and here you see a view of the exterior with three of the five houses that were delivered to the site of the show, which was titled Home Delivery, literally the little play on words, since you can get a pizza delivered in the United States, that's called home delivery, but here literally the home being um, delivered. But the only thing that brought all of these together was that all of them had been fabricated in one place and delivered to another. And all of them were models for something that could be replicated. So these types of conditions interested me, but also the process of how do you think about designing something that's going to be produced in a factory under different conditions than the way many building sites still are and something that might be replicated. What was the condition of architectural thinking, of architectural uh, uh, conception that was involved here? Indeed, how could the Museum of Modern Art put on display design thinking and not simply designs? How could we make an exhibition of the process of designing and making rather than simply placing models of things on pedestals to be admired as though they were works of art, even if they were baffling for many viewers. One other thing while I have this one view of the interior and um, on display at the same time, I wanted to put these newly commissioned works or works that were volunteered to be delivered to the museum by 
current practitioners engaged in experimental practices. You see the work of Philadelphia architects Kieran Timberlake and the now deceased Anglo-German architect Richard Horton there. This was the only one that was then in production, this microcube house, and an experiment by a South Tyrol, um, sorry, for Altberg uh, Austrian uh, team uh, here, uh, just the corner of it. Um, I wanted to put those in a much larger sequence. I thought as an architectural historian arriving in a museum of the 20th century, myself a specialist in the 18th and 19th century, that people would be rather nervous that I would turn the museum into a place of some kind of antiquarianism. And I wanted to absolutely banish the notion that this was a, either a contemporary show or a historic show. Uh, in fact, it would be simultaneously uh, both and not exclusively um, either. It occurred to me as we started to work on this that the actual delivery of these houses, these buildings to the site was going to be an urban spectacle. That the exhibition was not something we were going to wait for the opening day and have a closing day, but the exhibition was part of a much longer process. And that we could turn the actual thinking of making these buildings, of delivering them, fabricating them, shipping them, but also of the curators working into a public spectacle, but also into public catalyst for debate and discussion. And that the exhibition space itself would be animated through films that would show you new modes of production from early car factories through all sorts of housing factories over all the objects. That in fact, it was the process of making this dynamic uh, thinking captured in film in a very, very active space, uh, quite different from an architectural, from an art exhibition that might want to allow you some quiet moments of contemplation, but rather an extremely activated space to get across the notion of fabrication and um, delivery. And finally, realizing that perhaps a site like Architizer was not the other of the architecture exhibition, but just one more tool, and that the website of the exhibition would be key. So we opened this website months before the exhibition, and each one of these little boxes that you see here, like Andy Warhol, here we had a film camera on the site, and it played with even less activity than the Empire State Building, uh, just sitting there, this empty lot, this empty lot, where each one of these six things was documenting a house that was being designed, fabricated, and shipped, only going to arrive in the last two weeks before the exhibition officially opened in this camera view there. Now, there were only five houses, so you might say, what is this uh, six days here? Um, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, each day, one of the teams posted an update on where they were, some film footage, some commentary. You could follow the evolution of these houses. One of them was coming from Hamburg, one from Austria, uh, one from Philadelphia. Uh, one was going to be fabricated on site by Larry Sass as replacement housing uh, for New Orleans. And in the sixth one, Peter Christensen and I, the curatorial assistant on this project, uh, posted updates on the exhibition itself as part of the project. So this was a website that was opened. The exhibition, in a sense, opened three months before there was anything physically on the ground. And it continued for commentary in the galleries where visitors could blog onto the site uh, and continue to be alive with new posts and invited editorials three months after the exhibition. It was this, in conclusion, that led to the project, which also Patricio mentioned at the beginning, uh, one of a series of exhibitions that I um, initiated that um, doesn't really have a name per se. We called them the Issues Series, found a small donor for them. Uh, in this case, again, with support as we'd had for home delivery from the Rockefeller Foundation uh, for a project called Rising Currents Projects for New York's Waterfront, conceived in 2009 and opened in 2010. The entire project from start to finish took just under six months. Uh, I was brought a book by the engineer uh, Guy Nordenson, who had worked in collaboration, if we can see this in a moment, um, go ahead to this, who had worked in collaboration uh, with the landscape designer, Catherine Sievet, uh, and the architect, Adam Urinsky, on a multidisciplinary, multi-professional um, study on how to make New York City as a model of a city that could be literally obliterated by sea level rise and the increased storm activity of climate change into a city that didn't need to abandon its site, but, but, but could be made more resilient 
to the changing uh, ge uh, geographic, uh, meteorological, climatic uh, conditions that are ours now of our own making in the 21st century. Uh, they had done some very beautiful drawings, made some projections, done a lot of data research. You see some of it here on low-lying areas of New York, where the Army Corps of Engineers wanted to install um, dams, kind of like the Great Gates that have been installed in Venice uh, to protect the harbor of New York. Uh, and Guy brought this to me and said, uh, don't you think this would make a great exhibition? And I said, actually not. I think... Uh, you know, Rem Koolhaas specializes in putting information on the wall. I want to show architecture. I want to show process. I want to show design thinking. I don't want to put your book on the wall. Rather, we publish the book. Here you see his research. We made it in publishing form, and we gave it as the research to five teams who were given an area of New York Harbor and invited to think about some way to make one of those five zones more resilient to a sea level rise and greater storm surge activity, particularly as we found out two years later uh, that the Verrazano Narrows, as most narrows do, accelerates the velocity and the force of, of sea tides uh, and of storm surge, uh, which gains speed as it moves to Manhattan. We saw two years after this project that actually much of zone zero here was indeed underwater for a number of hours. So, what we did uh, here is coverage of the project even before the, arc, the exhibition opened because following a kind of model that had been explored one previous time, I excavated this exhibition in 1967 in which four university teams had done a critique of urban renewal in Manhattan and the lower Bronx and displayed it during the summer when it used to be that there were few um, visitors to the Museum of Modern Art in the summers in the old days, so it was a safe time to do risky shows. And this, they all went back to the universities and studied these projects, and then they brought the Museum of Modern Art, who displayed them for the summer in the lobby to the film theater. We rather got a prominent gallery right near some of the major paintings of the Museum of Modern Art, and moreover, we didn't allow these teams to go hide away in universities, but rather we installed them at MoMA's PS1, the Contemporary Art Center in nearby Queens on the other side of the floodable East River. This was a moment when then director Klaus Biesenbach said with the economic meltdown of 2008, I can't keep all these galleries open. How can I make it look as though PS1 is fully operating when I really want to close at least uh, one whole wing of the museum uh, spaces here to save money? I said, don't close them. I will install teams of architects and designers working with hydrologists, working with landscape designers, working in a new configuration of a kind of think tank, but the think tank will be open once a week to experts and to city officials to come in and to consult and to discuss, and it will be open several times during the six weeks of this, as you see here, to the public. It will be invited into a place they've probably never been, an architectural studio. They will see a pinup, those of you who are architectural students do it all the time, but it's mystifying to the public. They will see how architecture comes out of interdisciplinary discussion, how it comes out of an interaction and debate, how a project evolves not as a hubristic imposition by a single designer, but as a collaborative process. And in the best cases, one that can even um, respond to public engagement, even as the public is educated on the issues and the complexity of the issues at stake. So here's the public literally pouring in to this exhibition about sea level rise in uh, 2010. And then a matter of weeks later, we took the results to this gallery at the Museum of Modern Art. Um, so that, there you see. And I could take you through these projects, but I think I would abuse my time. I see it's already six o'clock. And we subsequently published them. So these are available in the book, Rising Currents. We never intended to have an exhibition catalog, because the whole thing was so fast tracked, there was no time to publish it. And since I was, had agreed to exhibit projects that didn't yet exist, I called it extreme sports curatorship. I had committed the walls of the Museum of Modern Art to something I had no idea what it would look like. Uh, and so therefore, how could it be photographed and published? It was only because of the enormous uh, attention paid to this exhibition that we decided 
after the fact, there you see the, the views of it, to publish the catalog from which these images come. So you can study all these projects online at the Museum of Modern Art or um, in the book that was published, the immediate inspiration was going to give a lecture at the university in San Juan, Puerto Rico, uh, where I saw a number of the student uh, projects were involved with thinking about the harbor of San Juan in relationship to the problem of rising sea levels and that the students were uh, had um, downloaded off the Museum of Modern Art website some of the projects of rising currents and they were critiquing them. So I thought we need to have this book Students are using it. This is exactly what we intended. So I can really end there, I take, uh, but I hope that you have understood that for me, this project, for all of its innovations, for all of its currency, uh, which were then confirmed two years later when Sandy followed much the pattern that Guy Nordenson and his associates had predicted, and the mayor's office of emergency preparedness called me in to ask me what I was going to do next. I replied, we want to know what you're going to do next, but I hope you've seen how, for me, this activism has a long history in the complicated history of exhibiting uh, architecture. The series continued with Foreclosed, which I did with Columbia University Professor Reinhold Martin. We followed the same issue, but we even found by the time of the open house day that we were able to have not only the designer here, Jeannie Gang, showing her project, to architecture students, to visitors, but to the then head of the GSD, Moishe Mustavi, and Sean Donovan, who at that time was the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development in the Obama administration, who, gave, who volunteered then to give an address during the open house day and to comment on what he had just seen. So at that point, we thought our engagement of the museum outside of the walls of the gallery had extended to the attention of the federal uh, administration who were trying to respond to the foreclosure crisis. So the series went on. We could go on. The website was an integral part of it. Pedro Gadano continued it with uneven growth. Sean Anderson, the current curator of contemporary architecture at the Museum of Modern Art, um, continued it first with insecurities on displacement and shelter on the problem of worldwide displacement and migration here. Can see and in the current show which just opened called Reconstructions, Architecture and Blackness in America. So if I left anything behind at the Museum of Modern Art in addition to that absolutely tidal wave of exquisite and important Latin American architectural materials, I hope it was a reactivation of the possibilities of activism in and outside the museum walls. So thank you very much Patricio for inviting me and I will stop my share there. Fantastic. Thank you, Barry. Many questions, many thoughts, many provocations. I'm sure we have many questions from our students um, that cross the Americas. Um, but I want to, so that they start warming up, I want to ask you, so this fascinating history, alternative history of activism um, at the museum, I want to question if you can follow up on the notion of the museum's international activism. Um, although located in New York, it's a very um, important um, cultural um, institution in New York, as you, as you know, as you have really uh, focused the presentation. Um, the museum also played a, quite an active role uh, in, in, inter in its international projection of the museum itself, but also in collaboration to, with um, different good US government institutions. Do you find parallels, contradictions, or paradoxes within this um, notion of an, of a, of an engaged uh, architecture department um, to change an open architecture culture in New York, in the United States? Um, what is the relationship with the world at large? Um, well, that's a very loaded question, Patricio, because it's a subject uh, of your forthcoming book and your doctoral dissertation and many, many discussions that we had as we um, both continued heroically and with great anxiety about where we fit into the Cold War history of the 
Museum of Modern Art's engagement with, uh, with Latin America. And although the Cold War is over, uh, it's not really over, <laughs> just has taken new forms. Um, so, but it's often, I think, uh, not as easy to see what might be the, um, how can I say, what might be complicit um, agendas, particularly in a, uh, you know, in the neoliberal world in which we live. Mm. So for those who are listening, just to fill in so this doesn't become a private discussion, um, Patricio has been working on the engagement of the Museum of Modern Art with uh, Latin America from, at least from 1940, well, you even go a little earlier, but from 1940 into the, into the 50s with the famous 1955 show, which at least chronologically was our point of departure for Latin American construction, 1955 to 1980, which took place, all of those in the politically charged uh, circumstances of the hemispherical politics of, of the Cold War. Um, and that is, you know, so there are always multiple layers, kind of like an onion, uh, mm -hmm. as one peels away uh, the different perceptions and intent and the rise of the notion that even an architectural exhibition generally thought to be the least influential thing that you can possibly undertake, um, begins to play a role in the complex cultural politics um, of the period, particularly uh, wooing the um, wooing friendships and you know creating what we know of as a kind of rare exercise of the United States in soft power, um, mm -hmm. in soft cultural power. Um, I don't know if your future book is going to do this, but what what is the shift of paradigm once we get into the neoliberal world, once we don't have the immediate direct relationship between certain figures in the cultural world of the Museum of Modern Art, very closely tied always, but particularly in the 40s and 50s to the founding Rockefeller family and their oil interests and their political interests. Uh, what is it now uh, when there is a different, um, should I say there are different financial is interests, less clear alliances between finance capital and uh, and political power. They're there, mm -hmm. they're much harder to perceive, and uh, I'm not sure that they can. You know, I'm not sure that they can play out with some of the um, incredible directness of several mm -hmm. generations ago. So I don't know if that answers your question or not. Yeah, absolutely. So, and, and also I, mean, I think there are, there are many, many forms that this activism can take. If, if, the, if the activism, if you wanna limit the activism to change, in being an opinion influencer, mm -hmm. and that is from the very beginning, whether it's simply aesthetic taste or whether by implication it's political alliances with architecture, but even art exhibitions have played a very important role in diplomatic histories of the 19th and 20th century. Um, you know, that's maybe on a spectrum of activisms, that is, that is one place. I was a little bit more focusing on those exhibitions that engaged the actual interests of designers outside the museum walls and inside the museum walls and how that how that functions. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's, no, maybe, absolutely. that's absolutely. maybe less um, less politically ambitious, but it's another mm -hmm. to say if you were doing a taxonomy of the way in which the museum uh, and needless to say this history that I'm talking about and that um, you're talking about in, in your book depends very much on the phenomenon of the Museum of Modern Art establishing very rapidly mm. an incredible cultural aura and cultural power for itself. Mm. Th this story cannot be translated to even the Detroit Institute of the Arts, which has one of the most fabulous collections in North America. But uh, there, you know, the Museum of Modern Art is at once sui generis and and a kind of case study. Mm -hmm. mm. Absolutely, and, and also what what think what differentiates right our contemporary um, 21st century moment is the the plurality of cultural centers producing 
message and attempting to be uh, sort of activists uh, within the field. So I, so um, um, the Museum of Modern Art, as you have clearly presented in the, archi in the architecture museum and your practice within it have carved a very clear and very um, uh, rich to articulation of what that activism should be. Uh, so I guess um, a, a question that I'm kind of been fascinating, fascinated now when you mentioned the activism of style, right, and how suddenly um, um, in a couple in the past couple of years, sort of the question of style, in a way, came back to hunt us um, in the past administration. Um, and, and so I was fascinated when you sort of juxtapose this uh, possi the possible uh, the possibility of juxtaposing two um, uh, curatorial projects. One is the activism of style, right, or the dictatorship of style, as Philip Johnson very famously said it, right. And then um, uh, the other activism that also happens, as you have uh, eloquently sort of unravel at MoMA, in in, the, in sort of those battles. If you see that, do you see that today? This kind of possibilities of uh, actually sort of framing in that because there's there, there are many um, uh, moments right when you sort of gesture uh, a possible history of uh, contemporary architectural practices the super graphics that we see already in the 30s right that are happening today the mobilization of data which is so prevalent in architectural culture and architecture exhibitions today so um, so I'm interested if you can talk a little bit more on these kind of connections. Um, uh, in how our 21st century moment um, it differs from uh, um, what you know, uh, Elizabeth Mock was actually doing and the museum was actually doing then. I, yeah, I'm, I think we could start. It's a great, it's a great question. I think it could be really a subject for several, several seminars like this to, mm -hmm. to actually to study it, mm -hmm. and would be very. I think it would be very interesting in a course like this. I'm delaying answering your question while I figure out what I'm going to say by giving a methodological prelude. Um, the, um, but it would be very interesting to take the model of rising currents into a course mm -hmm. like this and say, how can we bring a whole series of um, disciplinary perspectives that could begin to answer that question? So. Mm -hmm. If the architectural, even if we stick to the architectural exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art, so seemingly both the subject matter and the institutional frame are the same. And then the question is, you know, are they really? But to try to figure out how the whole context has changed so radically uh, to bring sociologists, yeah. sociologists and historians of the media uh, to you know, at what moment does the fact that the Museum of Modern Art introduces something into the conversation and that gets it going, at what moment does that shift and people, in fact, are just waiting for the Museum of Modern Art to make its move so they can jump on it and criticize it because that's the mm -hmm. wrong to make because, in fact, the shaping of opinion is happening in such a much more, I, I would argue, but I'm not a historian of the media, is happening in such a much more complicated and interactive um, media landscape. Mm. That, that I'm answering your question by yeah. saying this, that would be the question, but I yeah. don't have the I don't have the answer to it. I do, I do think things have, you know, I think that things have changed radically. On the other hand, there are certain continuities. I told the related the anecdote of being called to the mayor's office of emergency preparedness, which for me was uh, a stunning and unexpected replay of some of Catherine Bauer and Lewis Mumford's relationships to the framing of both the New York City Department of Housing and to federal legislation on housing. So, um, you know, that's been debated what is cause and effect there, but um, that was a very stunning moment for me to go into that room. I thought they were just inviting me to the meeting because they thought I was interested in the topic and I'd like to hear what they said. And I was late as one used to be in the world before Zoom. And um, I walked into the room, they were all there waiting for me to arrive 
to start the meeting uh, when you're thinking I was lucky to get here because the subway was flooded a couple of weeks ago. Um, and they said, what are you going to do next? And I said, I'm an art historian. <laughs> I, I want, you know, we all want to know what you are going to do next. I am not a specialist in climate change. All I have done is figured out a way to exploit the museum's capacity. So here I'm a little bit eroding what I just said, to exploit the <laughs> museum's capacity to redraw the contours of the possible debate. So that I think is what you still can do. You can have some effect on what are the contours of the debate, but the debate is a mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. We have a question from Javiera, Javiera Rodriguez. Oh, okay. She, can you ask it, Javiera? Marcela, they, if not, I guess we can read it. Um, uh, thanks a lot, Barry. I find I find it interesting how, as a result of the pandemic, many museums have closed and have faced the problem of. Oh, there you are, Javiera. Please ask Hi. your question. <laughs> um, okay, I'm gonna read it because I speak Spanish. I'm sorry, but first, thanks, Barry. Um, I find it interesting how, as a result of the pandemic, many museums have closed and have faced the problem of how to exhibit without having the work of art physically. And it seemed that the virtual version of the museum space and its virtual tour is not enough. However, this problem is something that architecture exhibitions have always been trying to solve. So I would like to think that architecture, how do you think that architecture can join this debate? Uh, what can be the new role of the museum now? And if under this scenario, the museum should be adapted to its virtual version? And if so, how? Mm -hmm. Well, it's a great question because I think many, many people think that when this pandemic is over, first of all, it's probably never gonna be over, um, so, uh, that everything is going to return to normal. I think uh, we're in that proverbial river that you can't step into twice. Um, the, there's going to be some kind of new uh, provisional normal. And I think that is the, your question is the question that every museum director and every museum curator in the world is trying to figure out. So on the one hand, the fact that there is very little what Walter Benjamin would call the aura of the original uh, when it comes to architecture means that architecture perhaps is the, has the least impact uh, from the need to move the materials of the exhibition online. And of course, I didn't show you any um, film footage, but I've always been interested in the architectural exhibition as a place that has a role for film and interactive things. So not everything is a static uh, object. So the internet lends itself very much uh, to certain aspects, uh, at least of what I've been interested in doing. The thing that falls out is not so much what you can present, it is two things about the architectural exhibition that I think are important, and maybe I didn't reflect enough on them with the consequences of having shown you the photograph of the Museum of Modern Art on the first morning I worked there, which is that the exhibition is an event. It happens from day, X, day A to date B. And so that already focuses our attention in a very concentrated way. And we attend the event with a, um, a very keen awareness of the presence of other people who we don't know. And so the being surrounded by people we don't know, I think is a very different notion of being in the public than being on the internet and seeing, not in maybe in Zoom, at least we see other people's faces, but uh, seeing the presence of other people's opinions, that is not, that's not the same thing. So that again, that, I don't, that we're in the middle of this, what, uh, what, that's, what that's going to look like, I do feel, and I'm not the only one who feels this way because I read editorial things that reinforce this, I do feel 
that our world is, was already before the pandemic very po polarized. And I think that the pandemic and our dependence on the internet actually accentuates that polarization. So um, if an exhibition could, as a physical space, be some sort of a place where different points of view could be heard and processed and responded to rather than shrilly rejected, uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm just uh, reflecting out loud on your extremely interesting question. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you, Javier. Uh, David, David Sadingan, it's a question. Thank you, David. Um, well, first, I want to say, um, can you hear me? Okay, yes. Uh, thank yeah. you, uh, Barry, for such a fantastic talk. Um, I'm going to um, I'm going to take you up on your offer to discuss the Arthur Drexler um, Bozar exhibition. Um, with regard to the subject of activism, I'm curious to know how you conceive of that exhibition's political legacy um, for you as a scholar of 19th century architecture, because it's so often described in disciplinary terms uh, with regard to the, the sort of impact that the large scale pre de Rome drawings had on uh, sort of disciplinary practices of architectural drawing and postmodernism. And then of course, the, um, the, the legacy that the very scholarly essays in the catalog had on the discipline of architectural history. Um, so can one speak of a sort of political activist ambition behind that exhibition um, with regard to preservationist policy or perhaps the politics of civic architecture? Um, and then maybe how you sort of approached or intervened that legacy in your work on Labrust at, at MoMA. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I need to start with the anecdotal. I'm really glad that you used the word, I think, ambitions that the show had because it was a show with enormous ambition. Um, I was invited a couple of years ago to the lectures, the annual lecture series given by the Institute of Fine Arts at New York University, and the, which is student run. And every year the students pick a theme for the year and then they ask the speakers if they would like to, they don't have to, but if they would like to um, conjugate, let's say the verb in relationship to that theme. Um, so they invited me and they said that the theme of the year was artistic failure. So I said, okay, great. I am going to give a lecture on when is an exhibition of failure? And my ch chief example was Drexler's show. And uh, it happened to be while Klaus Biesenbach's absolutely um, uh, disastrous uh, show on, um, why am I blanking on her name, the Icelandic singer? Bjork. The Bjork exhibition was up, which was panned like wild. Um, it was also up while, I think it was while the Fabulous show was up, I can't remember. Anyway, um, the uh, Bjork exhibition was up. And so I started by saying, showing photographs of it. And I said, by failure, I don't mean when is an exhibition bad. By what interests me in terms of failure is when an exhibition has enormous ambitions and the fallout, the results of the exhibition are not only quite different because exhibitions are by nature unpredictable what's going to happen from them, but in some ways are totally contrary to the intention. Drex, in my view, Drexler's architecture, the Ecole des Beaux-Arts show was a colossal failure, not because it didn't receive a lot of attention, it got an enormous amount of press, it completely mystified people. But if you go back into the documentary record, it had a very complex agenda that had to do with some of the things that you evoked, had to do with historic preservation. It was a continuation of the critique of urban renewal. It started out as an exhibition that was going to be on great cities around 1900, and so, including Buenos Aires, interestingly enough, for this group, uh, and then morphed into something else when Drexler fell under the um, seduction of those drawings, which were being excavated by these young Anglo-American scholars in the archives sort of newly reorganized at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts. He himself, I think, was led to regret, and I'm not the first to say this, that the show rather rapidly was seen as one possible birthplace of a very articulate type of literal postmodernism or even neo-neoclassicism. 
Henry Hope Reed, whose name appeared on the screen at one point, was overjoyed by the show, as was John Barrington Bailey, uh, the author of that absolutely hideous extension to the Frick collection. So the, you know, the, it was, so it was in, in his terms, it was a flop, even though it was a huge uh, success. And when you tell many people, even people who saw it, that it was a show that was a, 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 a critique of the modernist city and of the loss of, of civic values, they look at you cross-eyed because they thought it was a show about the beauty of neoclassical architecture, of Beaux-Arts drawing, et cetera. So fascinatingly, since you ask about La Brousse, I think it was the first time since La Brousse's uh, infamous 19, sorry, 1829 restoration of Pestum that a student, student's homework assignments had such polemical impact. I mean, can you imagine? They you fill the galleries of the Museum of Modern Art with student homework and everybody gets mystified and upset. It's extraordinary. It's really an extraordinary event. Is there a dimension to your question I've missed out? Uh, no, that answers it. Um, yeah, because I, I was just wondering if, you know, the, the items or objects on display were sort of self-defeating with regard to a political potentiality because they were all about sort of demonstrating an expertise for institutional approval in the system. Um, and then they could only be appreciated publicly in a sort of connoisseurial manner um, when hung in the museum. Um, but that's a whole other subject and I don't wanna yeah. <laughs> take oxygen. Well, it, it also picks up on an extremely minor sub theme that I threw in there at one point, which was, when I showed the gallery of, uh, that included the horrible housing conditions in Astoria and on the Upper East Side of Manhattan in the 1932 show, which was, can you exhibit things that you in a museum that you do not want to be admired? So is the invention in the 18th century of the art museum inevitably, even today, a temple of art and the default position, you know, like you walk into well, nobody goes into a bank anymore, but when you would walk into a bank, you would never say out loud the balance of your bank account. It's, everybody knows that, it's just forbidden. It's just, and you also don't speak loudly in a bank. It's like a coded behavior. You walk into a museum, you're in the code that you're in a place to admire, that what you are being shown is to be admired. And this was already a problem in the early history of what is today the Victorian Albert Museum because uh, Henry Cole had installed a gallery of good and bad taste and they dismantled it very rapidly because the public liked the display of bad taste. So it was a complete failure. Excellent, thank, thank you very so much. Marcella, Marcella tells me that we need, we need to cut. <laughs> on, on camera, just, uh, yeah, I'm the bad cup here. Yeah, bad thank cup. you so much, Barry, and, and thank welcome. you, David Javiera, for the questions, and Patricio, of course. Um, we see you all thank on you. April 21st for the fourth yeah. event of the series. And thank you again, Barry.